Hey kids, this is Chef Jack. I want to apologize first off. Uh, if my voice sounds a little rough, it's because I'm still fighting the head cold. Um, anyway, I want to thank you for joining me here for this next chapter in the history of comic books. Uh, Englantine and I enjoyed doing this video series, and we were discussing the early days of comic books the other day, and I noted that it was absolutely necessary for us to discuss artist and animator Windsor McKay and his con contributions to the comic art especially his masterpiece, Little Nemo in Slumberland. Englantine agreed, and he immediately said, well, since you're the bigger fan of his, how about you do it? He does this kind of thing to me all the time, but, you know, this time I didn't mind so much because, like he said, I've always been a huge fan of Windsor McKay. Zenas Windsor McKay was born on an unincorporated farm just across the U.S.-Canada border from Michigan. Uh, nobody knows precisely the year he was born because he didn't have a birth certificate. I mean, not even McKay himself was sure. In 1910, for example, he told a reporter during an interview that he'd been born in 1869, and this is the year that's listed on his grave marker, but later on in life he told another reporter entirely that he had been born in 1871. And then his obituary, which was printed in the New York, New York Herald, uh... It, and was based on information given to the newspaper by McKay's own children, said that he was born in 1867. So, like I said, nobody was sure when he was born. What they are sure of was that just about when he was three years old, his family settled in Spring Lake, Michigan, and he grew up there and considered Spring Lake his home, or, you know, his hometown for his entire life. Windsor started drawing at a very early age, and he was a talented and notably prolific artist, even from the beginning. And once he started drawing, he never stopped. His attention to and his memory for detail uh, honestly bordered on the superhuman. He, he was one of those artists that could recreate entire scenes that he had only glimpsed once, managing to capture the smallest level of detail while doing so. To give you an example, at the age of 13, he drew a picture of a shipwreck that occurred on Lake Michigan on his school's blackboard. The picture was so close to being photorealistic that... It, 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 later uh, pictures were actually taken of this chalk drawing and were sold to collectors. It, even, you know, Windsor McKay, he loved to draw and he was very, very good at it. Unfortunately, Windsor's father, Robert, who was an entrepreneur and a junior partner in a chain of five and dime stores throughout Michigan, was the type of person who thought art was nothing to build a successful life on. When Windsor was around 19, Robert McKay enrolled his son in a business school in Detroit with every intention that Windsor would give up this art nonsense and learn a real trade. It, it did not do any favors for the relationship between the two men. Young Windsor hated the lessons at the school, when, and he didn't bother going to most of them. What he did love, however, was that he was hundreds and hundreds of miles away from his family, especially his father. As I said, they had that sort of relationship. While in Detroit, McKay got his first professional job doing advertising posters for various dime museums in the city. Now, dime museums were a popular form of entertainment at the time. They were purely designed to separate people from their money. They were one part circus, one part amusement park, one part vaudeville show, with a little bit of freak show and art show thrown in just to, to round things out. They would feature permanent acts and traveling exhibits and uh, uh, jugglers and all kinds of performers. McKay would eventually go from creating advertising for these places to becoming a performing artist for uh, one of them, a Wonderland Dime Museum. His act was quite literally to draw portraits of the customers for 25 cents each in under five minutes. If he couldn't do it in under five minutes, they would not have to pay, and they got to walk out with a picture of themselves. His facility for observation, his artistic skill, and his ability to draw quickly and accurately made him very, very popular and made him quite a bit of money while doing it. The job also drew out Windsor's need to please other people with his art. He would say in later life that while he always possessed a need to create, he had an even greater need for other people to approve of the things that he was creating. When McKay finally left Michigan in 1889, he first went to Chicago, where he worked for a while as a printer. By 1891, though, he'd moved to Cincinnati, where he'd returned to the type of work he liked best, working as a staff artist for a dime museum. While in Cincinnati, he married and had two children, 
and to support his new family, he took on extra work painting signs for various shops around town, doing private portraits for hire, and other artistic odd jobs. But in 1899, he finally found the job that would make his fortune for him. He was hired by Life magazine part-time to do occasional political cartoons. Despite being a hick from Michigan, as he called himself, it was clear that McKay was ready for the big time. The big time came in 1903 when he received an invitation to come to work at the New York Herald. So he pulled up stakes, moved his family to the Big Apple, and thus began the most prolific chapter of his life as a cartoonist. From 1904 to 1911, McKay produced an amazing array of political cartoons, advertising art, one-panel joke strips, and ongoing weekly comic strips as a rate that was simply unheard of before or since. He was, McKay would later say, possessed by the demon of art and compelled to draw and draw and draw. To give you an idea, the total output of cartoons and comic strips pr produced by Windsor McKay during these eight years surpasses the total lifetime work of Peanuts creator Charles Schultz. In early 1904, McKay had three abortive attempts at newspaper strips, Mr. Goodenough, Little Sister's Beau, and the furious finish of Foolish Philippe Funny Frolics. Yeah, try saying that three times fast. None of these strips did very well, but McKay never gave up, and he kept trying new things when the old ones failed to catch on. He was rewarded for his efforts with Little Sammy Sneeze. Little Sammy Sneeze debuted on July 24, 1904 and ran every Sunday until December 9, 1906. It was a six-panel strip that relied on a solid and regular, if a little formulaic, plot. Something would happen to make Sammy sneeze. The last panel would show the consequences of the sneeze. Everybody knew the last panel was coming, so the pacing of the rest of the story was everything. And this worked for two and a half years. Not content to do just the one strip, McKay began Dream of the Rarebit Fiend on September 10, 1904. For a long while, this was his most successful strip, and it ran all the way to June 25, 1911. Because he was contractually obligated to the New York Herald, and because Rarebit Fiend was printed by a different newspaper, he used the pen name Silas while creating it. Dream was a thoroughly adult strip. It was surreal and weird, and it was devoted to the examination of adult dreams and nightmares and phobias and concerns. And it was all caused by eating too much Welsh Rarebit, which is a type of cheese pie, just before bedtime. McKay then created a third strip, The Story of Hungry Henrietta, which ran from January 8th through July 16th in 1905. It was a very modern take on child rearing and told the story of a young girl who was raised by a loud and self-absorbed family that proffered food in place of actual love. A fourth strip, called A Pilgrim's Progress, began on June 26, 1905, and it ran for more than five years, ending on December 18, 1910. All of these strips were formula-based, requiring only a new setting for Sammy to sneeze at, or a new nightmare to exaggerate, or another situation for the parents to ignore Henrietta, or another attempt by Mr. Bunyan to rid himself of the valise marked Dull Care. This formulaic approach allowed McKay to invest all of his creativity in the drawing of the cartoons. Even the panel shapes and the sizes of the strip were fairly stable, with Rarebit being the most experimental. So with these three strips running each week in two different newspapers, as well as other daily uh, cartoons and drawings for the New York Herald, McKay was finally ready to create his masterpiece, a comic strip which would, in the end, make him one of the most recognized and influential early artists in the history of comics. On October 15th, 1905, Little Nemo in Slumberland debuted. The long-lasting influence of Windsor McKay's Little Nemo on comic strips and comic books cannot be overstated. Simply put, Little Nemo revolutionized the art form. There is no other way to say it. Little Nemo in Slumberland was a weekly fantasy adventure whose main character was a young boy named Nemo. The name means no one in Latin. It was based on a world of dreams more magical than Oz and more wonderful than Wonderland. Each strip would find Nemo dreaming himself into a surreal predicament from which he always awoke in the last panel of the comic. It was a groundbreaker, folks, and it demonstrated McKay's strong sense of visuals, his mastery of color, his sense of linear perspective, all elements found in very few other comics at the time.
In addition, McKay would often experiment with the formal elements of the comic strip page, arranging and resizing each of the panels to suit the story needs and enhance the visual impact of the narrative. McKay would ignore the usual means of story pacing. He would play with the perspective. He would use the space given to him by the newspaper however he wished. And when it fit the needs of the strip, he would make things weird. For example, when in the second strip of the entire series, A Forest of Mushrooms grew, the panels got bigger and bigger and bigger as the story went on. And when the mushrooms collapsed on top of Nemo, everything shrank back to normal. In another strip, a Thanksgiving turkey grows to enormous size and eats Nemo's house. And while doing so, it fills the panels until ultimately it takes up this huge circular panel in the center of the page. Nobody had ever seen anything like this before, and it was wonderful. Often, the background color of a panel, or even the color used to illustrate a character, would change from one panel to another in a psychedelic imitation of a dream sequence. McKay was careful to annotate the Nemo pages for the printers. He found this necessary because at first the printers would ignore his instructions, just print whatever colors they thought was appropriate. But within five years of arriving in New York City, McKay had become one of the uh, uh, most uh, uh, appreciated and most powerful artists of his craft. I should mention that while Winsor McKay is seen as one of the most influential comics artists of all time, he's also a revolutionary groundbreaker in another field, the animated cartoon. His comics were about pacing and movement and action and narrative, and he combined all of those elements into his animation. While McKay wasn't the first person to make an animated cartoon, he was the man who singularly defined the industry. He made only 10 animated uh, cartoons over his lifetime, and they were all hand-drawn, and some of them contained 20,000 cells. Uh, the quality of these works would not be equaled until Walt Disney, who himself considered Winsor McKay to be one of the greatest influences on him as an animator, began to make Mickey Mouse cartoons. And while his animated version of Little Nemo might be the best se his best-selling cartoon, it was Gertie the Dinosaur, which was made in 1914, that it was considered his absolute masterpiece. Unfortunately, McKay's ride to glory was not to last. In 1911, after the New York Herald rejected his request to take some time off to visit Europe with his family, McKay waited until his contract was up and then jumped ship to another newspaper, The American. The American was owned by William Randolph Hearst. Uh, as a result, the New York Herald lost its star, and it lost three comic strips, but Windsor McKay lost all of his creative freedom. You see, all that McKay wanted was to be able to draw and be creative, and all that Hearst wanted was somebody who did what he was told. Nemo was published in the Hearst papers as In the Land of Wonderful Dreams, since the Herald still had the rights to the Nemo name, and thus it lost some of its readership. In addition, the coloring process at the American just wasn't as good as the one at the Herald, and he didn't have the editorial freedom, and he he didn't have the, the right to do what he wanted, so McKay became disheartened. This lack of enthusiasm shows up in the various strips he created for Hearst from 1911 to 1913, and the sales just weren't there, so Hearst stopped publication of all of McKay's strips and ordered him to concentrate solely on political cartoons for the editorial page. And that was specifically to, pu pu uh, to push Hearst's agenda, which primarily at the time was that, hey, there's a world war coming, Hearst didn't think the U.S. should be involved with it. In 1924, McKay left the American and returned to the then-renamed Herald Tribune, where he tried to revive Little Nemo. The relaunched strip only lasted for two years because it proved to be out of touch with post-war America. It just wasn't what the people wanted anymore. McKay was allowed to purchase all the rights to the character from the Herald Tribune for a dollar, which was a magnanimous gesture that doubled as an insult given the evaluation of his lifetime effort. Windsor McKay died in 1934 after spending his last eight years back at the American, once again drawing editorial cartoons. Throughout his life, McKay had been a light-hearted man who just wanted to make beautiful pictures and entertain people. He wanted to make newspaper strips and cartoons that appealed to the eye and appealed to the soul. He wanted to draw, he wanted to make art. And no matter how many barriers stood in his way, he actually accomplished that. And today he's considered one of the true giants of the comics industry. And ironically, despite everything that he did, despite there's so much to his ongoing legacy, what he's remembered for the most is a single comic strip that he only drew for six years. 
Since his death, the art of Windsor McKay has influenced hundreds of artists, animators, filmmakers, and even musicians. Jack Kirby cited McKay as an influence, as did Maurice Sendak, Neil Gaiman, Alan Moore, Art Spiegelman, Will Eisner, Carl Banks, William Joyce, George Alex Effinger, even Rob Liefeld has cited Windsor McKay as an influence. In addition, filmmaker Federico Fellini cited Windsor McKay as the primary influence on his work as a filmmaker. Uh, rock stars like Alice Cooper and Phil Collins and even Tom Petty have all cited Windsor McKay. So the man is, is bigger than just comic books. So there you go, kids. One more entry in the history of comic books. Did you like this look at one of the unsung pioneers of the art form? Did you hate it? Tell me so in the comments below. Englantine and I find the history of comics to be a vital part of our collective popular culture, and it's, it's a huge part of our, our, uh, our adoration of comics themselves. And so we're going to be doing more of these videos in the history of comics. If you enjoy this thing like we do, please click like. Let us know in the comments. If you want to see more content from us, click subscribe and click that little notification bell so you never miss one of our videos. Share it with your friends. If you want to help us out, we do have a Patreon page and a Vidme page. They're linked below. Feel free to hop on over there and drop a dollar or two in the till. But even if you don't, we appreciate your time and attention. And thank you very, very much for watching. Oh, hey, one last thing. If you're interested in seeing the full collection of Windsor McKay's art for yourself, currently it's being preserved at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum at Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio.